something has to happen on the inside. Otherwise, without that change happening, which is, we'll call it the renewal or the realization of what God's intentions are in conforming or transforming us, is we will never know, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say, we will never know the true Christ in us if all we do is go through the motions of pretending, acting, thinking of, versus yielding, surrendering, and letting God be the Christ-likeness in us. That is the process through the agency of the Holy Spirit that begins sanctification. <laughs>
have the emotional mindset towards that, but neither, not one of these that I have spoken of, fits into an understanding of sanctification and the operation that is worked on in you and through you by the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. So, what can we know? Well, the first thing we know is we encounter a word in my three verses of scripture that we're going to look at, which I've dealt with before, but probably not with this application. And the reason why it's important to do it in this order is to show something that is mm, obvious or self-evident, but maybe for the purposes that we were previously studying these passages, we didn't see it. We weren't looking for that. So the first example I want us to look at, if you will, please turn with me to Matthew 17. And um, while you're turning there, we will, in Matthew 17 and the second verse, although I will start at the first verse, but at the second verse, we will uh, encounter your English. King James says, um, transfigured, was transfigured, and so forth. That Greek word, the Greek word there, which most of you, if you've been around, you've heard or seen me teach on this. I'm writing phonetically, so it's not written in Greek. Meta morpho, and in this case, it is maybe derivatives of pho o or of cis, morphosis. Cis depending on your, your endings. Meta, the Greek word for with or alongside, and morpho, in this case, to connote a sense of change, transformation, remodeling. And if you were to read the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, in the Greek world, not in the New Testament world, but in the Greek world, this word was used often of what the artist imagined when he took the clay in transforming his and bringing forth what wasn't to what he envisioned to be. That was also used that way in that sense. So we have this Greek compound. And this Greek compound is appearing in the text I just told you to turn to as being translated as was transfigured. And let me read, we've seen this before, but let me read with the sake of pointing out something, the intent of pointing out something that will be different from our other two scriptures. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. So we only have here a very intimate setting, Jesus, Peter, James, John. And it says, and... Jesus was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was as white as the light. Now what's interesting about this, with this particular use of was transformed, which is the Greek word. Um, in fact, I'll tell you exactly how it appears. This is 17.2. And in the Greek, the 17.2 looks, if you're interested, it actually, it, because it is a uh, verb in this case, so it may look a little bit different, but um, let's see if we can. So we have here, metmorphothe, fothe. So here in Matthew 17, 2, and this is what's really important, even when they saw Jesus, and I want to, doesn't matter if you don't understand what morphological tagging is at this point, if you're just tuning in. Normally when I do this, I can morphologically tag a whole sentence, then we pick apart the syntax. I'm not looking to do that. I want to keep this as simple as can be, so I only want to focus on one thing. Mm, if you're interested, verb, indicative, aorist, but this one letter right here puts this in the passive. You remember what I said last week regarding the transformative changes that occur in an individual, that these changes are passive. I stand still, there is something performed by me or received by me, but it is 
in a passive fashion, which I'm going to keep repeating this for the sake of those people out there that are so adulpated in their thinking that somehow they have convinced themselves that this word is something that should be active, and it's not. You receive something by God's grace. That is a passive act operating on and to you and in you. In this case, it's a passive act when it says, and was transfigured before them. That even tells you that this is one of those when people talk about dividing the Godhead, and I tread very carefully because it's one of those very difficult things. But even here, because some people have asked me, well, is Jesus and is Jesus and God the Father not recognizing the triune, the three parts of the Godhead, are they one and the same? And the answer here is that the act occurring passively on Jesus means that while Jesus was in the flesh, there had to be an act from another actor performed on him. He did not passively perform on himself, otherwise it would be middle voice and reflective. Is that clear? Yep. Wowza. Okay, we just, I just assume that you all are Greek scholars now, so we can just move on with uh, Greek 2.0 or whatever. Okay. Um, but the reason why I'm pointing this out here, and this is what I want you, even if you don't understand Greek, it's perfectly fine. What I want you to see here is that there was something visible when it talks about that he was transfigured before them. His face did shine as the sun, so brightness, and his raiment was as white as the light. Now this is, again, we tend to compartmentalize things, but this is essentially the same essence, although Moses was just a man, not God and man, but the same essence as when Moses came down off the mountain, it says in the King James, and he wist not that his face shone. He didn't know that he was radiant after he'd been exposed to God's Shekinah glory. So with that being said, we're now, the disciples are being confronted with, if you will, um, well, I'm going to make up a word, the Shekinahfication. Wow. <laughs> because it can only happen here. You can only make up words here like that. But the Shekinahfication of Jesus, in that moment, they could see they could see his face, they could see his clothing changed, okay? So why is this important? Because this word will occur in two other places used of the Apostle Paul, and quite interesting, they are not used the same way. So I'm going to try and prove the point. Let's go to Romans 12. And here we'll do a little more picking apart. And I also brought out the 26th Translation Bible because we're going to see if we can't, as the expression goes, read into some stuff here. Okay. When the Apostle Paul uses this word, and he'll use it here in Romans 12, and he, he will also use it in 2 Corinthians 3, going 3 through 17 and 18, I believe, are the verses. With that being said, the important thing here, we'll see if, if you can pick this out real quickly. So Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, minimally. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, there is our word. It's a derivative of our hagios word holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. There is our, our metamorphosis word again, be ye transformed. But here is the interesting thing. You see, when the disciples saw Jesus, they saw a visible change to his face and to his clothing. When Paul describes it here, he is speaking of renewing of the mind, be transformed in the renewing of your mind, inward change. And the same thing will be true of what is being said in 2 Corinthians 3, 17 through 18. Inward change, something happening to the mind. So it is important that we, we kind of look at this and see the first glaring uh, difference between used of Jesus, visible, 
we can see the changes versus the things that Paul is describing which are internal. Now, let me read from the 26 translations something that um, is said here on these two verses. Um, let's, let me just read through these because perhaps it'll give you a better idea. Uh, when it says here, now, I beseech you, brethren, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice to offer your very selves to him, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all your members and faculties as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is either consecrated and acceptable, holy and well-pleasing, dedicated and fit for his acceptance, consecrated to God and worthy of his acceptance, and so forth. But when you get to the second part of this, and be not conformed to this world, uh, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, listen to what is being said in the 26th translation. But be ye transfigured in the renewing of your mind, but by your new attitude of mind be transformed, but by the new ideals that mold your minds continue to, trans to transform yourselves. But let God, remold your minds from within. Let yourselves be transformed by renewing of your minds. So you can see where this is going. Even if you were to just stick with the King James, it is an internal process that Paul is describing. Now, when, this is why I'm trying to be a little bit more methodic to get to the how-to of what we're discussing. Um, there are several observations out of this passage that will be directly because of the presentation of oneself and the not conforming oneself to the world. The first one is separation from the world. That doesn't mean that you stop going out into the world. It simply means recognition that God called you out from among, which is what Ephesians says. We have been called and chosen out from among others that have not been. So suffer the poor fool who says everyone must be saved because that contradicts what the Bible says. It says very clearly, I've repeated this for the last 15 years or 14 plus years, which is uh, out of the mouth of Ezekiel. God says all souls are mine, but not all souls are created for honor. Some are created to destruction and dishonor. Having said that, you can clearly see separation from the world, or nonconformity to the present age. Now, these verses have birthed movements of people who have taken things to the nth degree and completely outside the pale. If the intent or the understanding of both, the, the Great Commission, that is Matthew, Mark, some form of it, if you will, in Luke, not exactly the same, which is go into the world and make learners, make disciples, teach the people. So there was never a thought on the part of Jesus or Paul for us to not go into the world and to not be in the world actively heralding the good news, but to not be homogenized with it, to not go with the flow. And that, by the way, is the problem with a lot of the churches today. But on the subject of this being metamorphosed, the real, the real issue at stake here is to go in and to see that, for example, a person like Stephen could be transformed. What did it say of him? As he was speaking, they said that he spoke and he looked like his appearance is the face of an angel, all right? And the same can't be said of, say, a person like Demas. Of Demas, it said he loved this present world. So it's, there is a clear understanding that this process that Paul is describing here can only take place, let's go through these things, can only take place through the first part, we'll say the first part of hearing, the conversion, if you will, that is many times what we've talked about, coming to the faith by hearing the word of God, that change that occurs, which is the metanoia, the English did something terrible in using the Latin word for repent, 
but simply metta and noya with the mind, with the mind to change from my way, turn from my way to his way, to metta melamai, which is the feelings one may get filled with grief for the reality or the recognition I am a sinner, I'm not okay, because that's how we all start off. I'm basically okay, I'm a good person. Wow, I'm a sinner. And I'm a sinner not necessarily because I sin, but I'm a sinner first and foremost because of the condition I was born in, and then the acts, the thoughts, the deeds, and whatnot. So two forms that we come to grips with in understanding. That is why God could transform a Stephen, but did not transform a Demas. The, the yield itself that Paul talks about in Romans 6 is part of this metamorphosis. Don't expect for God to begin working a work of changing you if the self has not been yielded. Remember Paul says in Romans 6, to whom ye yield your members, you're essentially serving to whom or what you have yielded yourself to. So, at least we get a perspective and we get an idea here. Internal change of the mind, we could talk about an inward change, a renewal, but there are certain key points out of Romans 12 before I go to 2 Corinthians that I wish to point out. So you don't think that this is a disconnected subject. The presenting of the self essentially is what, if you wanted to use a proper term, con with consecration. Even though we have difficulty still working with that word sacrar from the Latin, but with, and let's, let's say it this way, with dedication, with cons consecration, presenting the self, if we're trying to figure out how does this process occur, the renewal of the mind, and you cannot, by the way, the mind cannot be renewed if the function of the mind is focused on the emotions, emotively, the mind will not be changed. Emotive or your emotions may be changed after the will has been worked on and you have free will, so it's the will for you to decide for or against or whatever is in your heart. And if we want to take that to kind of the next level of things, we have to kind of bring this to spiritual connectivity to the wholeness that is the fullness that all is what God intends for us to become or to be, not fragmented in part. This is why I mentioned that subject, which I've taught on already too, which is the part deposit, the Greek word, erebone, the part payment, the part deposit of God's spirit in us. All of these now start to fit together to understand how this process occurs. But the yielding of the self, the presenting and yielding of the self, essentially is where it begins. Because if someone is not yielded, they are not yielding themselves to God. You can say, I'm open to the idea, but to present myself wholly with the erroneous idea that if I present myself wholly to God, I will cease to be as I am. And life as I know it will cease to be. That's not the way it works. Remarkably, when you yield yourself completely, completely to God, you become the self, you begin to become the self that God intended you to be. So with that being said, because I know there's a lot of scary things here, but what happens with this inward renewal? Now the capacity to, with an inward renewal, to first and foremost have interest in the things of God, which should have already begun before this renewal and this process started. But actively acting on God's word, taking in and receiving, meditating, praying. It's the things I've been saying for weeks and weeks and weeks that you hear, you take in, you discuss, you talk, you meditate. And you think on these things and what they may mean for you in your life, as I take them, what they may mean for me in my life. And begin to think how? Does this apply and how is the application made? And that's what we're doing today. We're looking exactly at that. So we move from Romans 12, and I want to take us to 2 Corinthians 3 because there is the other use of our word. And I think it will kind of bring this part of what we're doing today 
to at least some uh, conclusion. So let's talk about this. Like Romans 12, we are seeing the word again, this metamorphose word. Um, 2 Corinthians 3rd chapter. And this whole section is, again, talking about this new way, beginning at verse 13. Um, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for unto this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So when people say, well, we're reading the same book, how come? Well, Paul says it. He could understand that as someone who was definitely steeped in Judaism, understood this concept, blind, because the veil is still there. Still, it has not been taken away because Christ essentially takes away. When, when you have come to know the truth, the truth sets you free. So it says, even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall, be, uh, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil should be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, here's your word again, same metamorphous word, are changed into the same self, the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So, here again, we are not talking about an exterior change. Go back to the example I mentioned about Jesus referencing John the Baptist, a burning and a shining that which is happening on the inside that's radiating outwards. Now, let me, before I explain this passage, let me just say one thing here. You ever met somebody, and you know this is the weirdest thing to say, but have you ever met somebody, and when you talk to them, you've heard somebody say, I was talking to that person, that brother or that sister, and I could see Christ-likeness in them. You ever said that or heard that or seen that? Okay. Now, usually those individuals are not trying to solicit, how spiritual do I look? How, yeah, how, how does this come across, right? They're not trying to solicit that. They just are. Usually you'll find that those individuals are unaware, and they usually are unaware of what changes have happened in their personality, but everybody else can be touched by it, see it, know it. That's the burning, shining I'm talking about. The danger of putting this in is that then people say, oh, well, if all I have to do is be kind to somebody and act kind, we're not talking about that. It's something that is ineffable. We can't really describe it or define it. It's very, the, the lack of ability to articulate what you experience or see in that individual but you know what you've seen. And I have met certain individuals like that in the, we'll say, the most unlikely places. And you find out that probably these are individuals who, at some point, have yielded themselves to God, have surrendered, if you will. And that term always is confused with people acting as though they will never have any life because now they've surrendered to God. And I've said to you, no, it's more abundantly. You live life more abundantly. But the reason for highlighting this is to say that there must be a renewal of the mind. There must be a change of the mind. Something has to happen on the inside. Otherwise, without that change happening, which is, we'll call it the renewal or the realization of what God's intentions are in conforming or transforming us, is we will never know, and this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say, we will never know the true Christ in us, if all we do is go through the motions of pretending, acting, thinking of versus yielding, surrendering, and letting God be the Christ-likeness in us. That is the process through the agency of the Holy Spirit that begins sanctification. That is not, again, we'll encounter this in, in other studies, that is not 
the I can see definitively you are, and I can, I'm looking at all this, or how I feel when you talk to me, it is something that happens actually to the individual and the first place of, we'll say, the, the first activity of transformation is the mind. And when I said I identified three parts of the mind, and forgive me, that's very rather simplistic, but I'm not wanting to engage in psychology 101, is to say that if the ability to think or reason has been tapped by God, whereas previously individuals looking at the things of God, the first reaction is, that's a bunch of craziness. Who would go and sit for an hour and listen to somebody talk? Who would give money? Who would participate? I mean, that's, that's how most people start off. Is, this is crazy stuff. Only crazy people would do that. Transformation of that reasoning, thinking mind begins, that begins to change the way we see things, the way we begin to understand things. From that, the will, the free will, or the intent of the will of the individual also begins to be worked on. We have free will. We have the ability to decide for, against, plus, minus, up, down. But in the things of God, if that will has been surrendered, that will begins to be worked on. Now, don't think that all this means that once all this is happening, it's on a slide which can't be stopped because there's always me to get in the way. There's always you to get in the way. That's the free will portion that says, ah, I'm tired of this. I want a break because you're all driving me crazy. No, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that. But the reality is that it's not what people think, which is it's this one, it's like getting on, um, you know, whatever goes cross country, a highway or freeway or I-10 from coast to coast and thinking it's just one straight line, it's not. There's gonna be lots of dead ends and lots of roads that go to nowhere along the way. So it's not one direct line, but we are transfigured. If you want to take both Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians, we are transfigured through communion with God, through the word, through prayer. We are transformed or changed through the agency of the Holy Spirit. And we are being changed into the likeness, into Christ-likeness. Now, some more, some less, this is why you can never make Christianity like a classroom where we've got grade seven here and then we've got the graduates or the undergraduates here. Why? Because you always will have, in Christianity, you're always going to have this, it is, always going to be a one-room classroom, people at different learning levels, not everybody's in the same place, not everybody has the same amount of faith, not everybody's at the same place of knowing scripture. So wouldn't it be insane to say, you should all be like this now? Can't. Each person changes as they yield themselves, as God does his work, some because he knows exactly what we need. Remember that scripture I often quoted out of Matthew 6 and verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, in the intent of seeking God and his righteousness, all these things which I'm telling you about will be added. That is God's promise to say, I didn't just bring you in to then leave you kind of standing here going, well, what do I do now? Yield yourself and watch the transformation. And you may not see it even. You may not even be aware of it. Other people will see it though. So when we talk about this, and this is what I kind of want to wrap up today. We saw in the transfiguration of Christ, there was a definitive observable change, his face, his clothing. When Paul talks about this, and I didn't highlight this from 2 Corinthians, but I will now, where it says, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed, are being transformed. And again, both here and in Romans 12, the uh, metamorphosis process is, is passive. It's, a pa it's something acted on you happening to you, you are not activating or doing it yourself. But here is the key thing. When it says, into the same image from glory to glory, there is 
again, that idea, you will not be changed in one fell swoop. Picture it like this. When I say I'm reading glory to glory, it's almost you can take two different examples. One of them I prefer more than the other, but from glory to glory, I used that expression one time of that thing you see the kids play on the jungle gym and you swing from bar to bar, right? But you got to grab hold of the next bar to get to the next bar, and it's a, it's, it is momentum indeed that keeps you keep moving ahead that way. If you want to call it that, which is your faith, not momentum, that keeps moving you from glory to glory, you, you are progressively, and I think this is true for every Christian, but we don't necessarily come to this conclusion immediately, progressively changing, and that is we can come to a place of understanding, oh, that's faith, that's how faith works, and then the next, my next spiritual development comes in the understanding of how to grab hold of a promise, for example. My next spiritual development as I keep swinging forward is that, wow, that actually worked that time. God came through. I guess I better keep swinging on the, on the bars, right? Glory to glory. It'll keep, God will keep entering in as I keep keeping on in him. Or if you want to say from glory to glory, think of it this way. If you were pouring liquid from one glass into another and you're trying to, um, say you had a little bit of ink in the water and you're trying to get the water to get lighter and lighter and lighter. You keep emptying the vessels from vessel to vessel with a little bit different water each time being added in and eventually the water may be back to almost clear. Whatever, you, whatever analogy you'd like to use, the idea is that you don't come into the church and like somebody says, oh, I was saved and I was sanctified and I'd like to tell you how they've never sinned, they've not breathed, they've not done anything and that's, again, I go back to and I digress. That is the wrong understanding of the word. It is the wrong application of the word. What might be a right understanding going down that pathway is a right understanding of your or my sinning self. And that being, as I said, one, the condition that I've been born in, in my Adamic nature, and then all the things through the course of my life, past, present, future, that I have done, which could be considered whether I knew them or not, sins committed, whether against a f fellow human or against God, but in the big picture, God sees it as all against him anyway. So why am I telling this? Why am I saying this like this? Because it is very obvious to me that there are so many bad explanations about the activity of God and God's purpose for your life. God's purpose for your life, let me just put it out there because I, again, can, I contend with and fight against all of these crazy voices out there that would like to tell you God's plan for you and they'll go on to tell you what God is going to do for you that sounds like A, too good to be true, B, doesn't even mention the things that have already been done for you, like if God never did another thing for you, the fact that he just saved your miserable derriere, you know, like let's not even include that because that just seems like a discount right there, right? But that's the forefront, that's the most important thing. So when we hear people talk about the, the emotive part of this, it cannot start there. Now, in, I think a few messages back, I discussed this, and somebody either wrote a letter to me or called in and said, well, you said, um, there, you know, emotions, and I completely twisting what I said, which happens because people have their little agenda in their brain and they can't possibly lodge a new piece of information in there because, by golly, you're going to wreck my apple cart. So, having said that, for the benefit of those people who just have extra wax going on, I am not saying emotions are bad, but you cannot start your faith or your Christian walk, and you can't even continue in it saying, I feel. This is why Dr. Scott used to say this, why we don't sing, ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. Yes, they sing a song, I know my Redeemer lives, I was very careful in selecting whether or not I would have them sing that song when I chose it, but I decided if the understanding was not because I subjectively think that he's risen, but because the word declares it as a factual event and therefore. So all of this emotive stuff may come into play once somebody has their theology squared away. At least you don't have to be uh, super theologian, but at least have the structure that says, no, that's not the starting point. And 
on top of all of that, what have I been saying about the person of the Holy Spirit? A lot of ministries, especially the charismatic and Pentecostals, I know I make lots of enemies when I do this, but I'll be an enemy for the truth's sake. Because some of you walk around thinking, I should have had that experience. That didn't happen to me. So maybe I don't have what they have. That is a trick of the devil and the biggest load of baloney. Because people see these events happening and they think, well, that must be. And I've said this before and again, I will repeat myself. And through this series, get used to it, I will repeat myself over and over until enough people have heard what I'm going to say. The Holy Spirit was not sent so that you could act like you have the power over people to do whatever you want under the guise of displaying your spirituality. Equipment for service on the day of Pentecost, given to give order. What does it say? When the Spirit comes, when the Comforter, when the Paraclete comes, He will remind you of all things, words of Christ to His disciples. He will remind you. He'll bring to memory all the things what I spoke to you when I was with you. Does that sound like chaos to you? Or how about even in the creation? When you look at the creation, the opening of Genesis, it says the earth was a waste and desolation. It, 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 whatever chaos occurred, God spoke, and in speaking so, in ordering all things into order, things came into being orderly. So I don't know where people get this idea that the Holy Spirit makes you crazy and makes you roll on the ground and your head spinning around, unless maybe you enjoy a good comic book once in a while. And if that's your faith, you have comic book faith, knock yourself out and have a good time laughing about it too. Uh, but if you're like me, I'm not looking for comic book faith. I'm trying to figure out along with you, what, what exactly does God expect from me when I go back to reading that passage, follow peace with all, all humans, all men, and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, I think maybe it's crystallizing for you. It certainly is crystallizing for me why I'm doing this, because if we don't understand what that means, if holiness is not understood, and I just described how the change happens, I've given you the first step. Maybe there'll be one or two more messages on this type of how-to and how, how things develop and unfold. But the most important thing for me is understanding if if what is said in Hebrews is true, then I better understand what all, what this means and how does an individual become holy. Now, just to kind of hang this out there, because I've been saying this for weeks, you start reading Paul's letters, and Paul's letters are, they all open with the same thing, more or less, Paul, a slave or a servant of Jesus Christ, to the saints at to the saints at, and that's our same word, a derivative of our hagios word for holy. So we can know something. We can know that people that were in the church in Paul's day were called saints. They weren't dead saints. They were living people alive in the church, number one. Number two, they were people that were being changed by the preached word because at the time there was only the Old Testament in circulation. And we can know this, that the changes, as I said earlier, communion, fellowship with the Lord, communion with the Lord, change through the person of Jesus Christ. Remember all the places where Paul says, in him, in him, referring to being in Christ. Now, all of these subjects start coming together, and you see suddenly that this word for sanctification isn't an island that's in isolation. It's attached to the bulk of Scripture we just maybe didn't understand the proper definition of where we, what we were looking at. So you end up with people coming up with all kinds of ideas except for the one that's truly needed. God's going to do the changing. God's going to do the transforming. Not transforming you into the you you'd like to be, but into the you that he destined you to be. And that does not, again, risk for being misconstrued that does not say now since I'm on the path God will take me all the way because I I cannot deviate off of it no you can you absolutely can and there are people who make a shipwreck and they hit rock bottom and they sometimes find their way back God will lead them back God will be gracious enough to show them the way back but you cannot force somebody so 
when people talk about the need for, and you're going to hear these terms as I keep going on this, personal holiness. I don't know what other type of holiness there could be. What, I mean, if we're not talking about Godward application, what could there possibly be except for personal holiness, the thing that God is individually working on each person to develop, to change, to transform into the image and likeness? And the process, by the way, this is the other thing, this metamorphosing word. We've often used, and I've taught on this out of Romans 12, the um, butterfly or well, the caterpillar struggling to come out and eventually emerges in the struggle eventually emerges as a butterfly. Um, we are constantly in the state, constantly, of the struggle of transformation. When you look at it that way, it's not I'm, I sit back and I relax and I'm having a transformation. I, I am, I'm in the sense agonizing in the transformation to come out differently. Now, that transformative process may be not maybe, it is. It's lifelong. That means successive events that will be the squeezing, uncomfortable, you know, how do you make wine? You, you squeeze grapes. How do you make olive oil? You crush olives. How do you make a Christian? I don't know. <laughs> but God does. And if you think about it, even our name, how we're referred to as Christians, that is just little Christ or Christ follower. Well, if you're following Christ, me thinks that there should be a change. If you're simply just following and he's not God and he's not Savior, you will not be changed. You're following, we're reading what the book declares, what Peter even could say, thou art the Christ. That following brings change. Remember the message. This all comes back to all the different things I've said all the time I've been preaching, what was Christ called to his disciples? Follow me, I'll make you something you're not. That transformative process, as we know, did not happen while Jesus was doing his earthly ministry. That transformative process happened from the day of Pentecost forward. And that did not make the disciples bulletproof in their now holy and they don't ever make a mistake. Listen, holy people, saints, whoever you are out there, that's the wonderful thing. I'm never going to tell you, you, know, you will not hear it from me. Those people that say, this is the subject you should preach to tell people about sinless purity, because there's, there's a group of people that teach that. You can, you can stop sinning, you can be morally pure, you can be... Uh, ceremonially pure. I'm not sure what planet those people are living on, but I live, I, I'm not of the world, but I do live in the world. And the fact of the matter is, whatever I'm exposed to, and I'm speaking for me, but it's a, it's a blanket for anyone else. The things that I'm exposed to on a daily basis, which I'm not necessarily going to look for, but they may find me, those things, as inadvertent as they may be, have the capacity to defile. So please don't say sinless purity. That is the most, um, really, it's the most ignorant thing you could say. For why did Paul say this? You know, when he said, all have sinned. And if you read properly, Romans 6 and Romans 7, which is describing the battle, and even Galatians talks about it, like trench warfare. You've now been found, and suddenly the lights are on, and, you know, I see the light, and everything's great, and all of a sudden I feel like I'm in the battle now. Before I was in this walk, I didn't have that battle, but now there is, there is a tug of war. Just like the devil was fighting with the angel, the archangel for the body of Moses, I think most of us do not realize that at the moment we are born again, a battle starts for your soul and for the ability for just that brief moment in time where the eyes are open, the heart is open, the ears are open, to hear and receive and start maybe saying, yeah, maybe when I had it by myself, I didn't do too good, and I really do need God to help me out now because I've messed it up. And sorry, you only get one shot here. I've said this for a long time. You better make it a good trip. And a good trip means, for me, means... If God has to do a lot of squeezing and a lot of pressure to get the 
we'll call it the fruit to come forth, then so be it. That's the point, is the transformation down here is like spiritual boot camp for eternity. Failure to understand that's what we're here for right now. Uh, I don't know how people think, well, I'm going to get over there and I can just fake it because I, I kind of fake my way down here for a time. I can fake it with God. Try it. I don't think it's going to work for you. That's the reverse of try it, you'll like it. So what I want to leave you with today is an understanding of the process and that unlike Christ, visibly, the things that visibly could be seen, the things that Paul is describing in these both Romans 12 and 2 Corinthians are inward changes that will indeed have an outward effect like that burning, shining I described of John, but it will not happen and can never happen. God will not try to lasso you into you yielding yourself. The yielding happens when you say, I'm bought with a price, I'm not my own. Jesus Christ is Lord of my life. That doesn't mean that my mental, the mental part of me is now in a mental monastery. It means I've actually exposed myself to more, more of God, more understanding, and even including more of seeing what the world is that I'm supposed to be separated from to better understand this is what I'm being changed to. The awareness of that, my friends, will bring something that I think is missing in the church today. I'm not looking to graft the world on and say, see, we're all the same. We're not all the same. We're all the same in the sense we've all sinned. And we're all fallen in nature. We're all the same in that we would like people to think we are better or more than we actually are. We're all the same in that way. We're all the same in the fact that we're born and we will die. Those are all the similarities and sameness that we contend with. But there are things that will differ from person to person when you talk about this subject. The one area where you're not going to differ. You will not start out saying, I feel like God has, and you add in. You may be able to say that when you flip everything upside down. I have yielded myself to God. The question in all honesty, and this is the big question for every single person listening to me. I'm not trying to frustrate the grace of God and say, well, are you sure you're saved? But the question is, are you sure you've yielded yourself? The question isn't, are you sure you're saved? Because you know whether or not you believe in Christ, whether or not you faith and trust Christ. Have you yielded yourself? Anyone with a real degree of honesty towards themselves is going to ask that question. And what have I been holding back? These are the discussions you have to have with yourself in order to figure out, have I yielded myself? You could be walking with the Lord for 30 years, but still, what's mine is mine, and that belongs to the Lord, and that what, which belongs to the Lord may be, uh, oh, say, this much of my being. This, uh, I'm walking with the Lord, and this is the part I give to him. I think there's a lot of Christians like that out there. And it's time for us to, when we say live in, in the fullness of his care for us, that's what I'm talking about. This isn't to be, to become some freak or to, you know, people think this is going to, this is going to affect this. What I'm talking about has nothing to do with this, but it has everything to do with what comes out of here. And this will be very helpful if you are reading some of the writing. A lot of Paul's writing is split into do, two in his letters. You've got the, we'll call it the theological, what needs to be masticated. And then there's the, what I've called the application portion, the practical living portion. Go back and read some of the um, latter chapters in Paul's writing where it's practical living and application with the mindset I just told you explaining this metamorphosis, and you begin to understand that Paul's not saying, hey, this is a cookie cutter, you just simply insert self, and you'll come out on the other end looking like this. The reality is, as I begin to look at his practical admonitions, and I think to myself, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it. I'm not there yet. I, the Lord's got a lot of work to help me understand where I'm lacking, but I'm not there yet. There's things that I still wrestle with. I'm honest enough to tell you that. I'm honest enough to say there are, th there are still things that I wrestle with that I realize God is still working on me 
to help me to understand or to better wrap my mind around. That is how I know that God is, is doing something in me. The day that I say I don't understand and I'm disconnected, I don't desire to ask questions, I have no interest, and I definitely feel as though, I use the words feel, as though, you know that there has been the pulling of the plug, that faith all along had kept connected, that connection to God which was basically a secure connection has now become a broken one. And I start imagining the things I ought to be doing and the things I ought to be saying and the way I ought to be acting and that is not sanctification. So hopefully I'm clearing up some of the, we'll call them problem child theological ideas that people have uh, taken hold of. They're their pet ideas. And hopefully we're making more sense of this to where there's actually a real application. We can actually go back in and start looking at what is being said, for example, and Thessalonians comes to mind because there are several references, including going from the third and fourth chapters, first Thessalonians forward, you're dealing with the subject of sanctification in a completely different way for those people. We need to look at that as well as what it means when Peter is saying or making statements that are clear quotes out of the Old Testament about be holy or sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ in your hearts. We need to understand all of this to the best of our ability so that we're able to say, I can, I'm trying to take this all in. Lord, help me to understand better and make a better application because if we are not changing, there's no growth. And I, I'm not your judge. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't see a change in you, so you're not, you're not doing something right. I'm simply saying there should be a change. It won't be a change that I can actually say to you, oh yeah, yesterday I did this and I know that that's a change. But if I, I've said this before, if I look back and I can look back 15, 20, 25 years ago, maybe for some who are just starting out, they're looking back at the last five years of their life and they're saying, you know, yeah, there has come a change and I didn't even, I wasn't trying to change. This is God. That's, that is an important key to recognize, but I've got so much more to go. He's got so much more to work on with me because I'm a work in progress. So are you. Anybody who says that they've arrived, saved and sanctified in this lifetime is a certifiable nut. <laughs> so unless you are into the nuts, the fruit and the nuts of life, I suggest you stick with the book. Keep pressing on on this subject. And I think as we go, it's getting clearer and clearer and clearer. We can say we know what subject we have exhausted at least to say it's not an emotive thing, it's not craziness, it's not I haven't, I haven't breathed since I was saved 25 years ago, right? <laughs> but God is graciously saying, yeah, you're brought into the world in a tainted, ruined state, but I'm going to change you and complete you through your lifetime, so that you can be like my son Jesus. And as you faith down here, as you trust him, he is looking at you as though you are like him. The change will happen. Keep pressing on, keep yielding, and keep faithing. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call one 800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.